Melanie Greenberg. I am thrilled to welcome you here in this room, to welcome everyone who's joining us on Zoom. It's Friday afternoon, and Friday afternoon is a time where we can just have a completely unscripted, relaxed conversation, um, just taking all the energy we've had this week and kind of settling into it. So the formal title of this session is, um, sorry, I should have memorized it, Rethinking Dialogue, Learn Lessons, Limitations, and Opportunities. What we really want to talk about today, beyond that title, is that many of us in the peace building field think about dialogue as being the DNA of what it is that we do. Many of us learned from John Paul Lederach, a very particular model of inclusive dialogue that works to build relationship, and from those relationships ripple out political and social change. There's a real conflict transformation, sustaining and sustainable element to dialogue. We on this panel, and I'm sure all of you, we want to hear all of your um, questions and comments and your, your experiences you bring into the room, have found that the idea of dialogue has blurred. And in a way, it's become a theory of everything. So we talk about dialogue in the US context. There is a lot of talk right now around bridging. Well, if you just have a conversation or dinner with someone from mm -hmm. another political party, mm -hmm. that's dialogue. And that there's something about having a civil conversation that will create change. At the under, other end of the spectrum, we're calling, and Maria Victoria, maybe we'll talk more about this, hard-edged political negotiation about political issues and reducing violence, we're calling that dialogue. Because somehow if we call it dialogue, maybe there's less of a sense of risk. And if that definition is so large, how are we thinking about the risks, um, the benefits, um, what is dialogue? Where are the different forms most useful? Do we need a different terminology? To do, how do we think about the values of dialogue? So the purpose today is really to have a conversation about dialogue um, and really to just try to delve more deeply into some of these ambiguities at, such, at a moment where the world clearly needs more of the positive kind. Um, introdu introducing our panel today, uh, Maria Victoria is the CEO of FIP, Fundación Ideas para la Paz in Colombia. Uh, she has been engaged throughout her career in policy research, the intersections of peace building, security sector reform, business, um, and is deeply thoughtful about what dialogue means in Colombia at this given moment and more broadly in the world. Alexander Shubridge joining us from Inclusive Peace. Uh, where he uh, works closely with leadership there on every aspect of dialogue that you do in inclusive peace. Um, we've been working together in some very interesting work in um, issues around uh, Belarus and from on the edges of the Ukraine conflict. Jean Paul Lederach, who is joining us uh, via Zoom, might single handedly be the reason that 95% of us have <laughs> entered the peace building field. Yeah. <laughs> 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 His book, The Moral Imagination, is a touchstone, touch, touchstone text for so many of us, and his work as a peace builder in Somalia, Nepal, Colombia, El Salvador, increasingly the United States, has been a model for all of us. So welcome, John Paul. We're just glad you could join us here virtually. And you are about eight feet tall. I'll just <laughs> let you know that. Uh, it's a wonderful presence with us in the room right now. So I thought maybe we could start just very informally with a conversation. Uh, as I came in, Maria Victoria and Alex were <laughs> already deeply into it. So just kind of continuing that, maybe give us a few points of what you were talking about outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, first of all, Melanie, thank you very much. And uh, it's so nice to meet you, Alex, in person. And uh, I'm so happy to be here and so privileged with, to be with uh, John Paul. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have you here mm -hmm. in person, but anyway, it's really a privilege and, uh, and I must say that uh, we in Colombia have learned so much from John Paul, really, really. And I say that uh, I'm, I, I've been uh, uh, into uh, trying to understand dialogue and the role of dialogue uh, in peace building in Colombia for the past few years, uh, thanks to John Paul and Humanity United. And uh, okay, so uh, uh, well, I, I think that that mm, we were talking. I think that maybe we can go a step mm -hmm. behind 
and uh, and I will gi la give like a few insights of dialogue in Colombia, and uh, and then we can get into it because uh, I would I would start with my fear right now in Colombia with dialogue, which is that uh, that everything has turned to be dialogue. So everybody is looking for dialogue. So we want to solve everything through dialogue, which is very positive <laughs> in, a, in a way. But at the end of the day, there is this thing about expectations. Because at, at the end of the day, if we engage in dialogue, we expect something to change. And we expect to change ourselves and to change the people we are. Uh, so interpersonal mm -hmm. change, but we really want to go further than that. And I think that th there is the, there is a, a, the problem. So right now in Colombia, I would say that uh, we, we have like, um, like a, a, well, these uh, dialogue, social dialogues that I, uh, I, I talked about in, uh, in one of the panels the first day. Uh, social dialogues where you know, people, different actors are uh, brought together and to talk about differences and, uh, and there was like a, a really a great increase of these uh, and uh, of these uh, social dialogues, mainly during the recent uh, uh, social unrest we had in uh, from 2019 to 2021, and really 2021. So from very very different corners of society, people were really trying to reach out and say, okay. We need to talk it over, and we need to uh, we need to find common ground, because agendas were very fragmented, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, we had had re a real long, long, long experience of political dialogue, but with armed and rebel groups. Uh, I would say from from the last century, uh, we have had different, uh, and, and we call it dialogue, <laughs> uh, because it's like the first step. It's dialogue and afterwards negotiation, negotiation towards a peace agreement. And, uh, and right now we have this new government in Colombia, which is the first uh, left government that we have had in, in many, many <laughs> years ago. I think it's the first one we have forever. Uh, we are a very conservative uh, a society in way. Mm. And dialogue has become like a cornerstone of this government. They really want to, and they are promoting dialogue all over the country, mobilizing people uh, to engage in dialogue. And, uh, but, and they are putting like in the same, <laughs> in the same, uh, like in the same uh, pack, they're packing in the, the dialogue with, you know, common people and uh, armed uh, groups. So they are having conversations. We have a number of, uh, we had a peace agreement uh, in 2016 that uh, uh, gave uh, the, the, the demobilization and the ar disarmament of a very important rebel group that was around like for 60 years in Colombia was the biggest uh, challenge for Colombian state. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, um, so, but still, we have different other groups, groups that emerge, dissident groups that emerge to, from a prior process we had with paramilitary groups and also groups, dissident groups from FARC, that demo and another rebel group that we, we, we weren't able to do a peace agreement. So this government is uh, proposing to have conversations and uh, dialogues with these groups, but also with society. So it's something, you know, like it's like, uh, it's really risky uh, in the way that you have these groups that are armed, mm -hmm. but civil society, no. Uh, but they, they, there's this view that civil society and participation of the people in general, has to be part of this. So, uh, so I would say that there is a, there is a lot of, uh, you know, I, I just want I just want to point out if if I can, mm -hmm. like three issues 
um, this was ju just you know to to in very general terms to to give you an idea of which is the scenario right now and we can you know answer any questions afterwards but anyway so I would say that uh, this government so there, there's like uh, this overuse of, uh, of dialogue that we're having in our society uh, I think that that poses like three ch important challenges and uh, the first one, and uh, you have heard me, Melanie and John Paul, a lot about this, is uh, is the efficacy of these dialogues. Because at the end of the day, people really want transformations to happen, and uh, and they engage in these uh, in these uh, in these dialogues, and maybe and we have seen real interpersonal transformations. People, you know, improbable people coming together and really changing the way they think about the, these other people that probably were their enemies. And this has happened. Uh, but uh, there's, the, there's the question about transformation. Why, at the end of the day, we, want, we come together because we want to transform something. But sometimes we are not even clear about what we want to transform. <laughs> and and that is like the first and and there's this sort of and I've been in a number of dialogue initiatives that pumped out uh, during the during the, um, the the civil unrest I talked about in 2021 and uh, and at the end there's always like this frustration so really really how can we uh, impact uh, policy and the changes that we are talking about and that we are agreeing upon in these groups of dialogue. How can we do that? So, so that is like the first, uh, like the first uh, big challenge, like the the efficacy of the of the process, and it is always very difficult to connect these sort of social dialogues, dialogues that emerge from civil society and connected with uh, with public officials. And in, in a sense, this has to do not only it, it is it is like you know a, a, a two way problem because it, it is civil society organizations that really don't want to uh, don't want to understand that public officials have like their own uh, agendas, their own law, and how to connect with those agendas and those spaces where they want to discuss a public policy. And, uh, and on the other hand, public officials that really don't want to engage with civil society unless they can control the scenario mm -hmm. or, or do this dialogue in the sense of not building something new, dialogue, mm -hmm. and then we talk about what can be built from here, uh, but more consultations. So the other, the other point that I want to, to make is about the scale and the scope, and uh, we were talking about this because, because uh, uh, in, uh, in, in our experience in Colombia, we have been like, like uh, um, looking for uh, and trying to find like a national dialogue scenario that brings us to a big national agreement. An agreement about something, and mostly the the, the main thing we, we bring in is uh, how to take weapons out of politics. It's like the the national agreement, and we can talk about that. But it is these national agreements. It's something that uh, for us it has been very elusive because the scale uh, is so huge. How can you bring everybody <laughs> in the same room <laughs> and? Uh, so in our experience, there, ha there has been a lot of local experiences and uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a, a, a scope uh, that are more specific that have been very effective and very interesting. The question is, how can we scale that up? And it hasn't been, uh, so we're still you know, <laughs> thinking about that and we're still in Colombia. Uh, yearning for a, a big national agreement where we agree on something, but we don't know what we want to agree upon. And, uh, and the, the last thing that I would like to bring in 
is the question about representation. Because, because for instance, this government uh, is, uh, is uh, they, they operate, they try to operate everything with dialogues, promoting dialogues all over. And, uh, and, uh, but these dialogues, you know, they want to bring many people into the room. But they're not concerned with the deliberation. So they did, for instance, uh, during the past few months, they did like 50 regional dialogues to bring in the most people they could be in, in very conflictive areas of Colombia, to bring a lot of people, and with the idea that in those, uh, in those scenarios, they will bring in um, or, or uh, proposals from the people will emerge so that they could be put into the national plan that is right now. It has just been, a, you know, a, it just passed through Congress. So, uh, so that brought a lot of expectations, but at the end of the day, what happened? This was, there was no deliberation. It was more the classic consultation, a consultation a, a scenario representation, who were there, the quality of, uh, you know, how many women, how many, who was represented there, and uh, 90,000 uh, uh, initiatives came out of those dialogues. Who knows if those 90,000 initiatives are into the national plan? Nobody. It's impossible. It's impossible. So, uh, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, well, I would leave it there. Just thank you, thank you, Melanie. Thank you for giving me the all this time for of course, <laughs> Bob. Okay. You've laid out a very challenging spectrum, Alex. You've had deep experience across a range of different conflicts and dialogues. Do these challenges around efficacy, connection, scale, and representation fit with what you're seeing? Yeah, certainly. And thanks so much, Melanie and, and colleagues, for the opportunity to be here. And it's great to be with you all. Uh, in conversation today. So perhaps just to say a few words about the organization that I come from and, and the work that we do, because I think it, it, it's, it will situate what I'm about to say. Um, so Inclusive Peace, we, we're a think and do tank. We do comparative research on different aspects around peace and political transition processes. And we have a particular focus on national dialogues, questions around inclusion, and so on. And so it's from that perspective that I'll share a couple of reflec reflections, which I think really um, fit well with, with the situation you're describing, Maria Ave, in, in the Colombian context. Um, and I wanted, to, I really debated with myself whether sort of to bring Shakespeare into the room, but I think I will. Um, <laughs> he should always be in Yeah, I, I feel like he should, uh, especially on a Friday, a uh, sunny afternoon and so on in springtime. Um, and you know, he said, a rose by any other name would still smell mm -hmm. as sweet. I don't know if the same can be said for dialogue, because <laughs> some dialogues don't smell that great, really. <laughs> um, and I think, and that's really what I wanted to reflect on today in terms of, yeah, some of, some of the issues which are not just unique to Colombia, but you can see more and more as dialogue becomes, well, potential saturation, certainly as it, as it proliferates in different contexts, and as it's used by different people to serve different ends as well. Um, we, as part of our work, we convene a community of practice of, of national dialogue practitioners. And some of our colleagues in Kenya, um, a, a guy by the name of Dr. Kuria, he's the head of the African Council of Religious Leaders, he talks about the Kenyan experience as a series of unfinished dialogues. So this idea that no dialogue is perfect, no dialogue can deliver on all of your expectations, <coughs> but they can build on each other. And so thinking that, that, that also shifts the sort of time perspective that one brings to, to considerations around this. It also has huge implications for how we think of success or, of, or failure of dialogues, and, and even using those, those terms can be quite damaging in a sense. Um, and I'll, here I'll use the example of Yemen, where there was a very inclusive, technically very well designed and very progressive national dialogue. Um, there was tremendous like quotas from youth, young people, uh, women, southern regions and so on. So it was incredibly inclusive and well designed, generated 1800 recommendations. <laughs> Two weeks later the country was back into conflict. Yeah. And so despite this sort of 
the technical asp aspects of it, it, it sort of moved away from some of the central questions around political economy in that, in that context. But at the same time, there's some really ex valuable achievements that, that came out of that national dialogue, right, in terms of how civil society organize, in terms of how they relate and mobilize, and so on. And that can be picked up over time as well, and you can still see some of that legacy in, in Yemen today. A, a second set of issues, um, which I think you see, there's, you see it increasingly, I think, or perhaps not increasingly, but there's increasing attention to it, is this idea of, of dialogue as smoke and mirrors. So dialogue being used, being instrumentalized, being practiced in a way that is not necessarily authentic or meaningful, um, but in a way that's, that's sort of co-opted from the outset, where the outcomes are pre-cooked, um, and it's being used to drive another agenda, or a political agenda, or to, to sort of daze and confuse. Um, and I think in, in a number of contexts where national dialogues take place in the context of political transition, they're sort of used to say, no, we brought the country together, we've reconciled, we've, we've decided to chart a path forward, but ultimately that, that power is, is very exclusive, the outcomes from the national dialogue are not inclusive at all, and it doesn't really help the country move forward collectively. The other side of that, and I think it leads to the same types of risks, is where you see dialogue as an imposition from, from external actors. So for example, during the, the recent conflict in the north of, um, north of Ethiopia, the European Union, the Security Council, others called for an <coughs> inclusive national dialogue for, for Ethiopia to chart a path out of conflict. That, uh, when, it, when stakeholders in a country are not necessarily ready for that, prepared for that, it can also lead to sort of this meaningless, um, not authentic types of dialogue processes. And it also can heighten the risks of co-option. So, so Melanie mentioned, or well, referred to some of our work in the context of Belarus. And in 2020, um, there was one, you know, one million Belarusians came to the streets calling for political change. The EU called for a national dialogue. The regime embraced that idea because mm -hmm. they could see it as an opportunity as well. So this idea of external imposition can also really heighten those risks of co-option. Um, maybe just two other points to, to quickly end. I think you, you also touched on it, Mariave and, and Melanie as well, but this idea of really connecting the dots between dialogue processes and other processes that may or may not be coming, happening in a country context, either simultaneously or previously or what comes afterwards. And oftentimes you can see a dialogue initiative with at community level or national level, whatever the case may be, being very much divorced from other issues around governance or reconciliation. And again, that's a really, a, a, a doesn't, uh, it fails to deliver on ex in terms of managing expectations, it diverts resources, and I think it really undermines the credibility of dialogue going forward as well into the future. Um, so I think, yeah, I would, I would end there. <laughs> I'm happy to pick up the conversation and hear from, from the big guy behind us all uh, as well. Um. Well, John Paul, I'm wondering, uh, with, with your permission and the spirit of dialogue, Maybe we can have a few questions of what's emerged so far, and then you can reflect both on those questions and on these really amazing themes that have emerged so far. The thumbs up? Okay. Okay, just maybe just a few questions now as we're sitting gently into this conversation. So just a comment, super interesting. And please introduce yourself. Polly Byers from the Karuna Center, and I, we hosted a panel in this room yesterday on dialogue, and we had practitioners from Nigeria, um, an academic evaluators are talking about the act of the hard research on, you know, academic research on dialogue and experience from different practitioners in different countries. And, you know, a lot of the themes that you're both eliminating, you know, came out about having clear objectives for one thing, um, you know, in terms of the expectations, efficacy, like, what's it for? Like, I, I'm, I'm just hearing all these themes, it would be interesting to hear more, again, about experience where you've seen it positive. I mean, there you're talking about Maria Victoria, these bazillions of dialogues with loads and loads of recommendations, and obviously then you have the real risk of, you know, doing harm, I mean, because that's what we came up with. Obviously, if not managed well, you really the risk of doing harm, being seen as co-opted. So again, 
it'd be just interesting to hear from your experience of where you know the the, the role of really of strong facilitation was brought up. Is you know these when you're really in you know I mean Israel Palestine was an example we talked about, and if not you know somebody is not really skillful that you start a dialogue and then I had thought about this, but you, you know create some bonding and trust and friendship, and if you don't really get right into the conflictual hard issues right away, it tends to you know, just not go anywhere. So there's just so much skill actually involved. So I'm just curious, in particular, I mean, any of any of those issues that you brought up to hear more about that, about the, the that facilitation aspect and the clarity of objectives, so that there aren't, you know, just a lot of frustration coming out of the process because it's like, you know, hasn't resulted in. Anything, so great, thank you. So just in case anyone didn't hear questions around what it means to facilitate a healthy and strong dialogue, and what are the clarity of expectations? Yes. Hi, um, so something that I was- Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, sorry. Um, something that I was curious about, and I was hoping we, uh, it might come up, is a lot of times when we talk about dialogues, we talk about the failures of them, um, and why they failed, right? Like when we look at uh, North Korea, South Korea um, conversations, we talk about, oh, they failed because everyone at that table thinks they're mediating a different dialogue, they have a different role, they have a different understanding of the conflict. And you mentioned um, you know, the big dialogue in Colombia, there was like 50 different groups there, and it was like completely, very, it was very difficult to actually manage. What, what have you found to be actually effective in creating um, a dialogue that succeeds in the goals that it puts out for itself. Again, can you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Mary. I'm Mary Hopkins. Um, I'm a student at uh, Johns Hopkins Ice. Wonderful, and thank you for volunteering at the conference. Is that what the badge oh, yes, is for? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so question, we often talk about failure, but what have we found is effective? And Melanie, there's a question um, from the uh, good. digital audience. Oh, from Joan uh, from Band United. How do you think cultural beliefs, practices, and norms impact dialogue oh, processes? Wow. Yeah. Uh, any examples of how these factors impact the dialogues you have been in? So I wonder if John Paul, if you'd like to offer us some reflections, and then Maria Ve and, and Alex will jump in as well. Thank you. Let me check that my voice is coming through okay. Maybe a thumbs yeah, up. Great. Okay, good. I'm a little worried with an eight foot screen that my nose is about three and a half feet of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great, great to be with you all. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, and I very much appreciate and share uh, the sentiments that were uh, very clearly articulated by Maria Victoria and Alex as well as a couple of the questions that came from, from the audience. I, so speaking from uh, experience, uh, I, I won't go directly to Shakespeare, but um, the, uh, I, I wrote an article not long ago on conciliation resources. And I can't remember if they left in the title that I originally proposed, which was, We Stink More Than We Think. <laughs> we what? Was, we stink more than we think. More than we think. It was actually in reference to um, issues of representation, among other things, participation. And I was using the word stink in a rather very vivid way, which was the notion that, um, uh, especially out of the world of people who study insects, etymology, they were working around what they called the, 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 the paradox of coordination. How do whole collectives cohere around purpose without centralized control? That was what they were looking at, especially around termites and ants and other insects, bees. And one of the things they found was that in, in moving around and circulating, um, the, the process of coordination happened by picking up a scent, that is a smell, um, or a trace that had been left in the landscape and building a coordinated uh, collective response without centralized control meant that there was a capacity to continuously circulate and build on things. And one of the things that, um, so if I would speak to some of what I think Alex and, and Maria Victoria were pointing to which have to do perhaps with the questions of both efficacy 
and to some degree scale uh, on uh, Mahdi Ray's first point. Um, what I have experienced over the decades is that people have mostly understood dialogue as the transactional event that happens when people are physically face to face. That is the encounter. Um, and that the preponderance of our skill orientation, just as example, is focused much more on the facilitation skill of direct inner communication and interaction. My experience has been that of the three or four elements that I think really constitute uh, uh, the, the quality and the craft of dialogue, it's got much more to do with the preparation, what happens between encounters, and what coheres around the notion of joint action or implementation as a part of uh, the elements that emerge from these accumulating often uh, ways in which dialogue was used to leave something and pick up something. And that we have, the risk has been uh, to reduce dialogue to a tool and to reduce it primarily to a transactional tool, which then lends itself to not only uh, raising expectation and correspondingly increasing frustration, uh, but it also lends itself to co-optation. Uh, that is that the notion of a tool is that it's something that you can pull out when needed um, and escape from, uh, I think, a lot of the hard work. I, I think if I was to offer a, a, a corresponding notion of the alternative metaphor around dialogue, uh, there probably would be two or three that I have most often found to be relevant, but that I have a great deal of time convincing people preparing a dialogue to move away from the notion of it, of it being event driven. Uh, so one of those is to understand dialogue as kind of a, a fabric. Or if you're from a culture that's basket making, basket weaving, or if you're in the process of uh, background I come from out of Mennonite tradition was a lot of quilt making, uh, threads and patches of things that were here and there that were brought together and that were never completed in any given afternoon, but often took uh, the better part of half a year to, to complete the, the notion of quilting, that is pulling together these the, the ways that things are sewn and thread threaded. Um, the, the, these are metaphors that point to dialogue as fabric rather than dialogue as event. And I, I think that that's one of the elements that's been hard to uh, to continuously work with is that it's often the notion that dialogue and its efficacy has to do with what comes out of a particular event, which is usually some form of recommendation or some form of something that should be done to change, but really no cohesive understanding of what kind of joint and coordinated action may be needed that is not likely to be controlled by any single source of power. And this is the, the challenge is that uh, the ultimate and I think most challenging understanding of dialogue is how best to, con to conceive that we are part of something that requires a collective form of power rather than a narrowed funnel approach to power. That is that somehow somebody will have the ultimate decision and that from there it will happen. Um, so it, it, it points in the directions that I think uh, I've been advocating over the last few years in particular that we should be looking much more at circulation understandings of dialogue rather than convening approaches to dialogue. Convening is that somehow you're about the task of bringing people into some form of event that is a face-to-face -face conversation, perhaps a series of them, and that from that, things will happen. 
circulation is much more about the ways in which you're threading, weaving, gathering, and leaving the scent in the landscape, if you will. That is a whole series of things around which a wider collective can begin to cohere. I think scale um, is, it requires ways of understanding complexity and coordination that are not easily served by the narrow notions of the metaphors of table and representation. The biggest, the weakest link that we've had in many of the notions of dialogue is that somehow representation is about getting somebody who symbolizes a particular identity. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think circulation is about two things that have for me proven to be very powerful and that I would include in a, a wider notion of dialogue. The first is that when you circulate, you go to the actual places where people live. It's in placement, if you want to use an anthropological term. And you, you, you see the world from the perspective of the lived and accumulated experience of those communities. Uh, with, with, with that understanding, it, it means that we have to develop something around the notion of collective empathy rather than individual empathy. Um, the second is that circulating requires you to go around and come back around over and again. And it's in that circulating that little by little things begin to emerge that offer potential for a wider collective understanding of what might be possible and can be committed to from the perspective of collective action uh, that may not happen readily in the convening of representation and then somehow the delivery from that through policy to actual action. Where have I seen this? Probably the two most uh, uh, startling examples are uh, Nepal and Somaliland. The, the, the Grand Borama Conference in the northwest of Somalia that became Somaliland employed a model primarily of circulation, employed culture, every cultural uh, resource they could imagine from poetry to wide open and widely spread um, long-lasting deliberations, um, but primarily it was a process in which there were extraordinary ways in which people, by traveling first to, you know, throughout the entire region and working from localities back to something that brought that region together, had a capacity to develop I, what I consider to be a, something akin to, to, to greater collective or uh, collective empathy. The second in Nepal is the natural resource conflict transformation movement, where they use very much this notion of circulating with a small subset of people from the communities in conflict, where they spend time in each community, understanding and looking at it from the perspective of their actual lived location and their understanding. And that circulation begins to stitch a capacity to eventually come together in much wider, more open, but well handled, I think, uh, large scale conversations. One could make the case that these are more regional examples, um, but I think that we, we, in essence, need to find some ways to, to uh, expand them. And I think one of the expansions of our notions of, of dialogue should be that we not get tied too narrowly to a convening model that relies heavily on narrow representation. It's proven to be a fairly weak in its implementation. Uh, I can make one final comment if you give me a minute, Melanie. Of course. It's very simply that um, I think the context that most of us are thinking about this are like um, Columbia is a place I hold very dear to my heart and I've worked there a long time with some extraordinary people um, over these decades is that this is a country that's moving from 50 or 60 years of, of open armed organized violence. And uh, I don't think change happens easily. Uh, if Colombia has spent a half century making a commitment now to try to open up in the direction 
of better ways to, to, to do politics without violence, um, we would only have to compare our own country here in the United States, where they have half a century, we have a century and a half. And we're still trying to figure out so many elements, so many elements of the violences, and I use that word in plural, of the violences that um, are a part of the fabric of the difficulties we have in sustaining um, citizenry without violence. And I think that happens only by way, so here's a small appeal, I suppose, that ultimately moving in the direction of dialogue is to make this something akin to having a greater capacity to sustain the habits that make fairness, inclusion, deliberation, understanding and decision making a part of the fabric of our lives rather than something that is the unusual event out of which we somehow after having not practiced it we are to find the miraculous delivery i think actually itineration moving around and iteration doing it over and again will ultimately prove to have a fractal quality that impacts the whole of a society. So while the word and terminology is misused and co-opt, I also believe that we have to find ways to keep it closer to everything, <laughs> including within our movements, our organizations, and across the deep divides that we have. Um, because I don't think that the alternatives of separation, elimination, or violence are really the recipes that move, um, you know, can be moved through without some form of engaging uh, with it, with each other and with our fellow citizens in conversations that actually mean something and make a difference. And I come back to that notion that the risk is actually how do we prepare that, how do we sustain it, and how do we cohere around collective action in better ways. I think dialogue sits as a thread in the middle of that fabric in many ways, but I don't think it's well served exclusively by the modality of um, convening direct face-to-face -face conversations in short periods in one-off events. Thank you, John Paul. And you, you wouldn't know this, um, but immediately before, there was a session where peace builders from Colombia and the Philippines spoke to a group about what it would mean to think about peace building and dialogue within the US. And those themes around curiosity, circulation, um, what it means like literally to have that fabric. Uh, from the Philippines, there was the metaphor of um, was there a, a dish that needs to be heated from above and below, and how to think about the connection from civil society into government. So, so thank you for reminding us this is not something that only happens in other countries. So reflections on John Paul's comments, and we'll open it up again. Yeah, <coughs> I'll, I'll jump in. So <coughs> thank you, thank you, John Paul, and uh, always. Uh, there are lots of reflections on what you say. And, um, and I will go to your question. Uh, building on mm -hmm. John Paul's reflections, and you know, they're very profound, and sometimes I'm, I'm very, a very simple person, so I can't, I just can't, there are some things I can get. But, uh, and English is not my first language, so bear with me, please. So I, I think that, uh, um, um, yes, there are effective cases, and uh, I think that the effective cases are precisely, uh, not exactly how John Paul uh, said, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, prepare, sustain, and go and get to collective action, and how dialogue is waving <laughs> all this path, uh, and, and the sense of process and not event. So uh, the first one, um, thing that comes to my mind, or the first word that comes to my mind is patience. Mm -hmm. So this takes, this takes time. And people are impatient because they want change right now. 
and uh, and we have had and we, and we have in my organization we have uh, participated and uh, and facilitated processes it's not a mediation it's not mediation i don't know anything about mediation <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's more facilitate processes where uh, we work a lot with uh, with uh, companies because uh, we are an organization that was founded many years ago by a group of Colombian companies that uh, and, and business people that were really concerned on trying to understand our work conflict and how could they help. So we have a connection. We don't uh, we don't represent them. <laughs> we are very independent, but we have a strong agenda and we truly believe that we need to bring in. Uh, the business sector, which is a very elusive sector to come into these conversations mm -hmm. because they are very oriented towards the result. So they want a quick dialogue, <laughs> quick result, and, uh, and please, because money, mo time is money. So, uh, so, and we have managed to, in certain, uh, in certain areas of Colombia, uh, some uh, operations of some companies are very uh, conflictive uh, and have uh, uh, various tensions with local communities, local authorities, and uh, even sometimes those those companies are like the main uh, economic activity for the people in those uh, in those areas. So lots of uh, there are lots of uh, tensions. In this, uh, and uh, and uh, we have the opportunity of uh, being part of processes uh, where we prepare first. We prepare people. We have because we think that we know how to talk and how to you know and how to relate, and uh, we are not prepared for that. Mm -hmm. We are not really prepared for that. So we begin preparing different parties that are going to take part of these conversations. And uh, and this is not a conversation uh, between the head of the company, no, because people. Wha what we have learned is that one of the main grievances of communities is that these people that work in this company, they just don't recognize them when they find each other, in, you know, in the local uh, store or uh, you know they. It's you know, <laughs> you have seen me in your facilities and now when we're out here you don't like, recognize me so the, these are really you very human things so we have to and in many of these companies we are talking about uh, engineers I have nothing against engineers but they are really <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing about uh, you know socializing and everything is not really their thing no. so <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> so, uh, so no, but that you know, we have find like really simple things that like, we are humans, you know, and we need recognition. So, uh, so uh, first we prepare. Yes, we prepare uh, Jean Paul a process. It's not uh, so. We've been doing this with one company in twelve, which has a huge uh, operation in twelve municipalities and very lots of tensions, lots of issues. So uh, we've been working for them with them for three years, and uh, and uh, and there are changes, of course, and we and we measure changes. We measure how because first everything is okay. How can we build trust? And how do we know that trust is being built? And how do we bring? We try yes to bring um, local authorities communities and people that are working in the companies in those specific areas and um, and uh, and the idea is not only to build trust because trust is great yes we need trust but what can we do together what can we do together at the end of the day so now after three years of this process they are doing projects different projects together and uh, I can't say, and this is the part where I feel a little bit uh, frustrated, uh, honestly, is because there is like this national uh, debate about 
this company and what this company is doing and uh, it's very political in both in the national uh, and the local uh, like in one of the big cities of Colombia it's a it's a huge political debate and there is a disconnect between what is happening in this process locally where people are cooperating and are in, a, in very difficult conditions and okay so and they are already cooperating and so it's possible but there is this disconnect between like this and and you have people that are already in congress that uh, that are against this company and they're campaigning against but still and uh, and uh, but locally you see okay things are happening and this is changing but okay so th there is like my but yes it's possible and I, I i have another another example but i can talk about it later so i can give some space well, I saw to I alex was nodding as you were talking so so i think so, so it is it is yes it is possible and it's all about preparation it's all about uh, being patient it's all about building and not building, but waving relations between. Uh, so thank you, John Paul. I learned a lot. <laughs> We've learned a lot because it's not me who is doing those projects, unfortunately. But uh, but people in my organization that ha do a wonderful job. So uh, so yeah, there is uh, there is reason for uh, for being. Um, how do you say that in English? It comes. Optimistic. Optimistic. Optimist. Yes. Optimistic. Yeah. So there is reason and yeah. Hopeful. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> yes. Uh, there is reason for hope. There is reason for hope. But I think when you address like more concrete and you work with people and and there are people that are very very difficult. The public officials coming into this for us it is key for to have them in the conversations that is so hard mm -hmm. and they send you in one conversation they send you one official and in the other one th there is no continui and, and continuity mm -hmm. and you really need to have continuity to build the relationship so it's very hard so usually in our measurements the 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 sector that always a uh, uh, points uh, worse are the public officials. I'm sorry, <laughs> which are key in this, uh, but they have a like sort of a different mindset. I don't know. I don't know. So okay, I would leave it there. No, but I think both of you, and it's come up in the conversation as well. I just wanted to mention two, just to share two reflections. One is sort of an opportunity, and one is uh, I think a challenge that the field is is facing in this space. <coughs> I think yeah, the opportunity. Let me frame it like this. I think public communication and expectation management is is a is a real challenge, and the majority of national dialogues, at least, or or dialogues that are, that are at a nation nationwide level, really fall down on this point because it's how do you manage expectations? How do you communicate what the dialogue is actually about? What it's for? What can come out of it? And where? Wh how is it a step for that country's journey over the next? you know, decade or two decades, basically. Um, and how is this an inflection point to, to, t to move that conversation forward? And I think one of the, we've really tried, we've searched under every chair and behind the bookcase and so on to find good examples of this. And I think one of the, one of the better ones is in the Philippines in relation to the peace process. And I'd be curious to hear if this came up in the conversation you were part of, Melanie. Um, whereas we're basically the president's social media team, we've heard a lot about social media and AI and so on over this week. Um, basically, the president's social media team was, but was the team that led the, the effort to sort of sell the peace process, not just now, but also what it meant for the future of the country. And I think this public communications piece is often, often neglected or underinvested and, and so on. Um, and that also involves like really being clear on what are pathways for inclusion in and around a process and feedback loops and, and transparency and so on. But I wanted to <coughs> sort of put on the table a challenge which I think we spoke about in some of the preparatory calls for this session. 
um, which it was like the countdown to Christmas, these preparatory calls. But anyway. Um, <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, no, in a very, yeah, in a good way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and it's, it's around sort of the commercialization of dialogue and, and the projectization of dialogue and how it, it leads to some of these things that, that John Paul and Mariave have talked about dialogue as a one off event, dialogue as short term. It's about, you know, it's about trainings, it's about convenings. It's not about this sort of decade thinking, which, which we've talked, which yeah. has appeared in conversations this week as well. Um, and I think, again, uh, particularly at a national level, um, you see, you know, when national dialogues come around, it's very rarely that, that national actors are actually driving and owning that process. It's, it's the project outfits, it's, it's UN agencies, it's other bilateral agencies that come in and implement a national dialogue project. And that, that creates, I think, a whole set of challenges um, which really touch on a lot of the issues that, that we've heard today. Okay, thank you. I wonder if we could open up uh, about your experiences with some of the challenges around commercialization, public officials, private sector, any of the metaphors that John Paul used. Can you talk a little louder, Elena? Oh, I've never told you to do that before. Elena Tanzi uh, with USAID, uh, and I spent eight or 12 years out of the field and was been back in the States for the last couple years. And I find a lot of the people, including myself, right, uh, who work on peace and conflict should not be very good at managing interpersonal conflict. <laughs> uh, the irony. I, 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 I'm, in a, I'm in an office full of violence prevention experts. Right? And, uh, and like we have a lot of conflict in our office, whether it's arguing about words or poor communication or other things. And so because of that and a number of like not so great experiences, I've been investing in my uh, conflict management skills, interpersonal skills. And so I would be, I would really like to learn, because the things that you're saying sound really hard to do. Uh, so how do you build these skills and how do you build also the stamina, right, to do the same set of iterative conversations for three years, right? Uh, because we do think in terms of projects, we do have limited resources, and in my experience, the funding and interest in creating more conflict, more disharmony is very substantial, right? And so how do you build the skills to do this well? That is such a great question. Yeah, wow. Could we get re three reflections of that? May I just, may I just say something? Yes, and, and, of course. And, and then I think I would like to hear John Paul on that one. Because, no, I think I, I'm just, it's it's a great reflection and uh, and uh, and I, I'm going to talk personally because um, oh my god I'm going to lose my uh, my friendship with humanity <laughs> with this one <laughs> <laughs> that will not happen I promise no but you know I I I used to really underestimate the power of dialogue mm. really and I thought because we were having so many dialogues in Colombia and mm -hmm. it was like blah, 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 yeah? So, sorry. <laughs> it's Friday afternoon. It's Should, <laughs> I Should I come in? Should I come in at a certain <laughs> point? <laughs> Save me. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so, no, really, really, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not really to have the skill, it's more to believe in it. Mm -hmm. For me, it's really, really, you know, okay, this is really a game changer. So how can I make it work for other people? And you also mentioned another word, which is harmony. Uh, this, this harmony? OK. So uh, on the sense of harmony. And I think that, well, not all dialogues have to be harmonicos? Harmon Harmonious. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's great to have, uh, you know, uh, really you know tough conversation and uh, and put out there it's not about harmony i think it's mm -hmm. about really you know how can we have uh, bring out our differences our grievances 
uh, hopefully in a, in a in a way that we can uh, that we can hear each other, and uh, and how can we move over, move over that and think that maybe we can do something together, and what is emerging here, what what is emerging here, and what can we build together, whatever whatever we can uh, we we can do together, so so there is this idea maybe that dialogue equals harmony and i don't think so mm -hmm. <laughs> i think the dialogue dialogue help us you know exchange ideas and uh, and be deliberative it's if it's deliberate it's better and uh, and uh, you know our, we are latin and we move our hands and, and probably you can think that i'm uh, you know very very uh, um, probably being rude even being rude in a way but but uh, but i think that it's uh, it's not about about bringing harmony it's uh, it's about an exchange and building you know empathy and uh, it's more about that yeah i think i'm just listen listening to the question and listening to mariave and because at the beginning we were talking about sort of co-opted dialogue and non-inclusive dialogue and dialogue as an event and not as a process and I think it's quite challenging to think about that at an interpersonal level as well right like there's certainly dialogues I've been involved in where you know either myself or somebody else has co-opted that dialogue so it's not meaningful and it, yeah I think it's like practicing what we preach I think is is um, yeah it's, I think it's particularly difficult for people in the peace building space because we have such aspiration like high aspirations for for the world we want to contribute to, right? And it's hard to hold yourself to that same standard, I think. Agreed. Yeah. John Paul, reflections on what it takes? Yeah, it's a great uh, observation and question. Um, let, let me just say that I appreciate in particular, Maria Victoria, your example of working with two extraordinarily different sets of communities, uh, one a business and one local, and how the preparation took the amount of time that it took and that you pointed to the word patience, which is certainly one that I would um, would highlight. Uh, I So I think there, you know, I, I've always uh, had the difficulty that um, the two words that most define what people wander around the world with when they do peace building work are two words that I have found over the years to become, I'm just less and less comfortable with them. Um, and one of, so the two words are tools and skills. <laughs> tools in that people want to be given something that will quickly resolve something. Mm. Or that will get, be the latest in the, the recipe that you need to cook something. Um, and skills is... I actually happen to believe pretty deeply in skills, but they're not the ones that I tend to see uh, as arriving most significantly in a lot of the training programs, which is somehow externalizing an ability or a capacity to do something for someone else at a given point in time. Uh, I, skills, I think, become meaningful when you understand them as embodied presence. And what does it take to embody? When we say practice what we preach. I actually think it's about embodiment. Um, it's in embodying the, 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 the core essences of what most of us want when we're feeling hurt, harmed, or fearful, or threatened. A and that is... Um, an ability to, to, to have within our presence um, non-defensiveness. There's a, there's a, it's hard to describe it as, as a skill, but it is um, not to become immediately with the answer or to have ways in which you defend a particular viewpoint, but to sit with the ambiguity that you may not know. How many skill trainings have you been to where somebody suggested that the most significant thing in conflict is unknowing? That is that you don't know the answer. 
<laughs> you don't know exactly what's going on in the middle of this complexity. And that there's a great deal of ambiguity in that uh, because people feel an urgency to have something happen. The same could be said, I think, of, of um, a skill like listening. I don't think listening is, a, is easily understood as simply that, you know, we can certainly use the, the crutches of saying back to somebody what they said, but listening is, is actually being present um, without anxiety or judgment to the lived experience of other people. And, and, and which sometimes can mean that you sit with a lot of pain mm -hmm. without having any way that you can alleviate that pain. And th that, that means, I think, that there is a slow but sure process of increasing our ability to be curious about what people have lived, to find ways that they feel a sense of safety to be fully who they are. And I think that safety to be fully who they are happens more readily when they're in the presence of people uh, who are without judgment and without anxiety, able to be open. And the third area that I would add is you have to stay with it. Uh, there's, there's patience and persistence in some ways go together. Um, that that openness to things that you don't fully understand and to stay longer with ambiguity. I often said in a lot of the work that I did as a facilitator um, that the core thing that I hope might happen in any given process is that people would raise their level of tolerance for ambiguity sufficiently, sufficiently that they could listen to understand what others had experienced, but also to listen to themselves in a new and deeper way. In conflict, because we say things, we often say them out of hurt. Because we say things may not mean that we fully understand the significance of what we're saying. And there's often a deep space that's needed for people to have simply the, the, the you know, a, a patience around them sufficient that they can they can get to what it is that they're really trying to say to themselves, which is often projected onto you know whatever it is that's the outside piece. So it's it's to me it's it's this I I, real, I realize this doesn't make very good log frame project delivery mode <laughs> because I've never seen a log frame that said we're going to work on on tolerance for ambiguity and we're going to work on um <laughs> you know uh, the ability to to uh not know the answer as as a way for people to actually have the space because it's within them and between them to bring it forward and I think that's the biggest thing. So much of skills seem to me to be oriented toward finding a way to externalize and take away the responsibility uh, to deliver something of an answer for others. What I think the real skill is the ability to create the conditions under which people get in touch with what it lies within and between them. And that that's not fully known at this point. And it will take time. I think we should encourage uh, um, a move away from from being kidnapped by projects to being understanding how complexity and change happen across decades and generations. Because most of the deep conflicts we're dealing with are multi-generational, most certainly. Sorry, I got to rambling there, but Melanie, I'll stop. No, that was that was actually a wonderful to end to our time together, I'm afraid. It's already just about 3.30. We started a bit late. <laughs> I, I wanted to honor my colleague Joan Marshall Messier's question, and, and I think you started getting at this, John Paul. The question was, how do you think cultural beliefs, practices, and norms impact dialogue processes? I think we've unpacked some of the norms around a kind of universalist 
definition of dialogue and the dangers that we've fallen when it gets into that culture of external, easily measured, quick. Um, but I think the question also of within individual societal dialogues, what are the very specific cultural norms, practices that inform those? And I think if we gather in this room next year, that might be an interesting place to start. Yeah. But I want to thank Maria Victoria, Alex, John Paul, all of you for your thank wonderful you questions. And I can't think of a better way to have ended our time together this week. So thank you. Well, thank you, Melanie. Yeah, Great conversation. Thank, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, John Paul.